discoveries of amazing prehistoric marine monsters are always exciting. In 2023, a 150 million year old sea monster was found in sediment off the English coast. In 1955, a mysterious soft bodied Tully monster was found in rocks dating back 300 million years. And in 1938, a 420 million year old fish from the Devonian, a member of an ancient order of animals that would one day give rise to all terrestrial vertebrates, was discovered off the coast of the Eastern Cape. But while the Tully monster and Dorset's enormous pliosaur sat very much dead in the sediment for all those years, this 1930s discovery, the coelacanth, was discovered alive. In today's video we're looking at the life history of this incredible fish. We'll follow the almost endless story of the coelacanth, and go into how a single unassuming line of vertebrates showed up at the dawn of fish diversity and passed through four great mass extinctions, only to disappear from the fossil record entirely, and then pop up alive and well in South Africa. But first, what even is a coelacanth? Today we're going to be talking about a fish, and of all common words for animal taxa, fish is certainly one of those that gets the most confusing. So to begin with, let's illustrate why that's so difficult. Take for example an oyster. Not much of a fish, but in culinary circles it's considered a shellfish. Still, maybe that is stretching it a bit since anyone with half an interest should know that an oyster is a mollusk and not a true fish. But then this presents the question, what is a true fish? Let's look at some examples. Most people would agree that a shark is a fish, but what about a stingray? Rays and sharks are much more closely related to one another than sharks and salmon, for example. So if you call a salmon a fish, then you should really call rays fishes too. And maybe you do, which is fine, but we can take this logical leap a lot further. And when we do, we start to get to the crux of the issue, because sharks and rays are cartilaginous fishes, and they diverged from one another around 200 million years ago. But the cartilaginous fishes themselves diverged from the bony fishes closer to 420 or maybe even 450 million years ago. And of those bony fishes, one group followed a fascinating path. In fact, it was a branch of bony fishes that climbed out of the water in the form of Tiktaalik and its ilk to become the first amphibious vertebrates. Over time, some of the descendants of these amphibians evolved to protect their eggs with hardened shells so that they could lay them on land, and thus became free from the restraints of a watery reproductive cycle. These were the amniotes, and some descendants of these would go on to get so specialized that their eggs became tiny and spent the duration inside the body. Some even evolved special organs to help this process, called placentas. And all of this happened over much less time than the bony fishes and the sharks have been separated. To cut a long story short, take your bony fishes, fast forward maybe 400 million years or so, and you get us. So if we are only 400 million years from a fish, but that fish is 420 to 450 million years from another type of fish, and they're both still fish, what does that make us? Well, fish, technically. Some of us more than others, of course. But this is more than just an exercise in pedantry, because the fish that we're interested in today was among that branch of fish that would, one day, spawn all of the world's greatest musicians, scientists, artists, and YouTube scriptwriters. And this branch of fish is known as the Sarcopteregions. A quick disclaimer here, not too long ago the Sarcopteregions were considered a class of fish, being at the time one of two bony fish classes. This specific ranking has been shuffled and changed and reshuffled over the years, and in some cases it's been ignored altogether, but wherever it sits in the taxonomic rankings now, while subject to change, it still represents a real clade of fishes. So for all intents and purposes, whether we refer to it as a class or a clade or a group is besides the point. Now, to follow the story of the coelacanth, we need to go back to before the age of the fishes, into the period with the best name so far, the Silurian. This was the time when the invention of jaws triggered an enthusiastic rush among vertebrates to eat as many of everybody else as they could. The Silurian champions of this competition were the placoderms, armoured-faced chomping fishes with self-sharpening bony jaws 
that looked like something out of H.R. Giger's sci-fi portfolio. We've covered Dunkelostius on this channel before, so be sure to check that one out later if you're interested in the scariest of those. But other branches emerged here too. The bendy equivalent to the bony placoderms were the basal cartilaginous fishes. The acanthodii, which would one day make up all of the sharks, rays, and chimeras in our oceans today. As for the bony fishes, they too broke into two major clades. The actinopterigi, who today make up the vast majority of bony fishes in the water, and the psychopterigi, who once did. And as the Silurian gave way to the Devonian, the so-called Age of Fishes, this psychopterigian group would be the dominant presence in all of the world's oceans. Sarcopter regions diversified further in the Devonian, branching into the coelacanth line and the lungfish line, to name two. And so this is therefore where the story of the coelacanth truly begins. About 416 million years ago, amid a tremendous explosion of fishy diversity, the vast majority of which would never even make it out of the period. Regardless, when the age of fishes began, it was the Sarcopter regions, commonly known as the lobe-finned fishes, who filled most marine niches. So for our friend the coelacanth, its family ties date back 416 million years, at least, to a time when the oceans were teeming with ancient monsters. Placoderms were still around then too, chomping smaller animals in half, and generally being a menace. But there were also lots of sharks. The eel-like Antarctilamna was an excellent early example, but there were more shark-shaped sharks as well. Cladocelacci would have been immediately recognisable as a shark, and in fact was one of the earliest sharks to adopt the relentless conveyor of teeth method that keeps modern sharks so dangerous. Trilobites, brachiopods and corals would have covered the shallow sea beds, and arthropods were starting to follow the plants up onto land. And coelacanths, like Serenichthys cowiensis, were lurking about doing what coelacanths have always done, around waters that are now South Africa. But what have coelacanths always done? The behavioural repertoire of animals from almost half a billion years ago is, as you might expect, a bit of a mystery. But there are clues. First of all, the remarkable lack of change over time between these primitive coelacanths and the newer models suggests they found a strategy and stuck to it, which implies they may have behaved very much in the same way as they do now. And contemporary model coelacanths are very intimidating animals. Coelacanths lurk in the twilight zone of the oceans, down to about 800 meters, where the surface light can't penetrate. Resting under volcanic ledges like Tennyson's Kraken for most of the day, there hath he lain for ages and will lie, invisible against the black rock until the sun goes down above them. Then slowly they emerge, rising up through the water column with just the lightest flutter of fins. Buoyed by a modified swim bladder full of oil, the coelacanths use an electroreceptive organ like a metal detector of death and combined with the enormous gape of the Sarcopter region class, they sneak up on and swallow anything unlucky enough to have wandered into the dead zone. And as quietly as it arrives, as night draws to a close, the coelacanth slowly descends back to its lair. This incredibly simple strategy, combined with a very low metabolism, has likely been the key to its survival. And if you're thinking that this kind of lifestyle doesn't take a lot of brains to pull off, You'd be right. Coelacanths have a brain case, but it is 98.5% fat. But as primitive as they are, coelacanths are highly specialised animals nonetheless. That fatty swim bladder is almost analogous to a lung, and it has muscles around it, kind of like the diaphragm, to squeeze it or allow it to expand, changing its volume and therefore determining how far up or down in the water column this animal can move. This specialised fatty organ has led to the relocation of its kidneys, which have merged into a single super kidney to compensate, and this sits strangely on the belly of the animal. And the chambers of its heart are also weird, aligned for whatever reason into a single row, unlike any other fishes, but perhaps representing the old style of vertebrate hearts. So this animal, despite its simple lifestyle, isn't as basic as it might appear, and this has clearly been the key to its longevity. 
and the Latimera genus that we know of today can be traced through the fossil record all the way back to coelacanths like Serenichthys cauiensis. Serenichthys was just one of around five species known from the Devonian, and around 175 described in all. And its remains, along with that of its juveniles, have been found in what would have been shallow estuarine water, suggesting that they had come up there to give birth. By the late Devonian, it wasn't just arthropods moving onto the land. The coelacanth would have likely shared its shallow nurseries with the more adventurous cousins, the Elpistostegalia. This was the part of the world's history in which Tiktaalik, our transitional fishy ancestor, started dragging our wet asses out of the mud and onto the land. These transitional species were making use of their swim bladders to function as lungs, capable of gasping air from the atmosphere to distribute to their circulatory systems. They were revolutionising the vertebrate anatomy, and almost literally breaking new ground. But the coelacanth was uninspired by this sort of adventurousness, and would choose to continue being a coelacanth. And statistically this was probably a good idea, because at the end of the Devonian, there were several pulses of catastrophic extinctions that ushered in the Carboniferous. Brachiopods and trilobites were hit hard, and placoderms snuffed it entirely. Bony fishes were reduced to percentages in the single digits, and even plants had a hard time on land. But all of this mattered very little to the coelacanth, who continued its daily silent migrations up and down in the water column, unfazed. The Carboniferous that followed was really good for the sharks, who came up with some fantastic examples. The 7 meter Adestus, whose mouth just doesn't make a lick of sense, swam around with a large pair of serrated scissors for a head. And Stethocanthus swam around it like a radar plane with a big old anvil on its back. Again, coelacanths weren't impressed. Coelacanthopsis was the model of the time, and from its fossils it's very clear that this would be the phenotype that the line was committed to. The Carboniferous gave way to the Permian, and more weird shark experiments showed up. The spiral-jawed Helicoprion was a good one, and an animal that's so weird it's hard to believe it looked anything like our modern reconstructions. But now vertebrates have been on land for so long that some of them had already decided to return to the water, and animals like Mesosaurus became some of the earliest aquatic reptiles. It's important to note that this was now the third or fourth period of geological time that the coelacanth had been doing its thing, and we hadn't even reached the Great Dying yet. The Permian was an excellent time for the fish lines that emerged during the Devonian, as well as for the newly experimenting tetrapod branches that moved up onto the land. But with the apparent exception of the coelacanth, all good things come to an end, and the Great Dying was actually not as positive an event as the name suggests. In fact, it wiped out almost all life on Earth. Marine life was hit particularly hard, with over 90% of marine animals kicking the bucket. Not the coelacanth, though. As the oceans ran out of oxygen and the water everywhere was pocked with belly-up fish, weird mouth sharks were rotting on the beaches and all terrestrial reptiles, with the exception of Procolophonids, snuffed it. Vertebrate diversity on land would spend 30 million years recovering. But meanwhile, the coelacanth was still there, rising ominously to make a quick snack out of one of the survivors and then descending back down to hide under rocks until it got dark again. The Permian moved into the Triassic, and finally things started to get a bit better. Dinosaurs were fending off the apex predators of their time with the intention of becoming top dogs themselves. And some of those reptiles that went back into the ocean became the largest predators that the world has ever seen. Ichthyotitan swam about, killing things bigger than you'd think could be killed. Pterosaurs took to the air, and the ray-finned fishes, the sister group of the Sarcoptor regions, showed a burst of diversity here, pushing out the Sarcoptor regions as the dominant group of fish. But apparently nobody told the coelacanths, because they showed their highest diversity since the Devonian during the Triassic. A changing climate would wipe out the oppressing force holding down the dinosaurs on land, and ushered in the Jurassic, which brought with it pliosaurs, plesiosaurs, and even more predatory ichthyosaurs. But coelacanths responded simply by getting bigger. Morsoniidae, a Jurassic coelacanth, grew to over 5 meters long during this time, and the earliest fossils of the Latimeridae family of coelacanths appear here too. 
And finally, the Cretaceous happened. T-Rex, Triceratops, and Velociraptor would run about killing and being killed, and Mosasaurs would get frighteningly big in the water. And there, coelacanths would remain, moving up and down in the water column day after day. But the reign of the dinosaurs would be cut short by a pesky little space rock around 66 million years ago, and reptiles would never make it back to their former glory. The marine reptiles would die out and be replaced with mammals, and finally, after more than 350 million years of moving eerily up and down through the water, coelacanths would disappear forever. Or at least that's what everybody thought. Just before we touch on the contemporary wonder that is the modern coelacanth, we'd just like to say thanks for sticking with us this far, and suggest that if you've enjoyed this video, you can really help us out by liking it and subscribing to the channel. We're very eager to make more like this, so your support really does help, and if you have a suggestion for topics that you'd like us to cover, please leave them in the comments too. Now, in 1938, a South American museum curator called Marjorie Courtney Latimer spotted an odd fish in a local fisherman's catch from the Chalumna River near the coast of the Indian Ocean. The fish had blue-gray scales and limb-like fins, and when she alerted ichthyologist J.L.B. Smith, he was rightly astonished to confirm that it was, in fact, a coelacanth. 66 million years after this animal was supposed to have gone extinct, here it was, being dredged up from the dark by local fishermen. And in 1998, a second species was found in Indonesia. These two species, now placed in the genus Latimeria, named after the museum creator who discovered the first specimen, are still the only two known, and have remained looking very unchanged when compared with their ancestors hundreds of millions of years ago. But given the coelacanth's success as a lurking, secretive survivor, it's hard to believe that they're the only ones left. Still, if they had been here the whole time, why didn't they leave any fossils? The disappearance of the coelacanth at the end of the Cretaceous points to a glaring bias in the fossil record. Conditions for the fossilization process are pretty specific, and the deep sea is some of the worst habitat for it. This is one hypothesis for why coelacanths seem to disappear, and it's a well-known phenomenon, but given the secrets this animal has witnessed and hidden over the course of its journey, you can't help but wonder what else is going on with it. And to this day, the coelacanth is continually surprising scientists. In 2021, it was reported that the gestation period for this fish is the longest of any animal known. Five years. This is a fish that doesn't even reach sexual maturity until 55, and one that was originally given an estimated lifespan of only 20 years. Today, it's thought that they necessarily live way past 100 years, and they are up there with the oldest living animals, like the Greenland shark, who can reach an estimated 400 years or more. Unfortunately, there is one environmental factor that this sit-and-wait style of survival is really bad for, and that is the human rampage through the ocean. The very reason we know of living coelacanths is because we have just encroached so far into the deepest depths of the water, and we're pulling out animals indiscriminately. Anything that takes 55 years to reach sexual maturity is at an extreme risk of over-exploitation. Today, both species are classified as endangered. But thankfully, given the coelacanth's history of riding out the storm in the dark, coupled with our own hurried stumble towards extinction, chances are looking good that we'll be gone long before they are. And that's been everything for this one. Thanks again for watching, and if you've enjoyed it, please don't forget to turn on notifications for the next one. And we'll see you next time.